Shalom, shalom, yashara. Welcome again to another edition of Watchmen of the Faith Ministries. My name is Kasada Ba. Now, first and foremost, before we do anything, like I always do in every show that I do, we have to give all praises, respect, and honor to the Father Ab Yahuwah for sending his ultimate love gift, Yahusha HaMashiach, who was that atoning sacrifice for the nation of Yasharal, and the redemptive role was this, to bring us back into covenant relationship with the Father again, all right? I'm going to say it again, to bring us back into covenant relationship with the Father again, and that is very, very important. Now, today I'm going to be dealing with um, a controversial topic, all right? And the title of the show is called Erotic Poetry or A Wedding Proposal for the Nation of Yasharal. All right. Again, Erotic Poetry or A Wedding Proposal for the Nation of Yasharal. Everything, for the most part, is going to be coming from um, the Song of Solomon. Again, it's a controversial topic. Um, I just thought that, listen, you know what? I want to um, share and express to the family what the father has showed me um what this um song uh, might be talking about all right this is not to challenge so much um what another brother or sister might think this is just to share with the family maybe we can look at it on a um a, a little um higher level all right now um i talked about the redemptive role of the messiah let's show in the scripture where it was known even by the Pharisees, all right, that the Messiah was going to come and that he was going to be that atoning sacrifice for the nation of Yasharal, all right? So for the, for the most part, Yasharal is without excuse, all right? I'm going to say it again. Yasharal is without excuse. The Messiah was that atoning sacrifice for the nation of Yasharal, all right? So let's go to um, the book of Yohukanan. The 11th chapter and I'm going to be reading verses 49 to 52 the book of Yohokanan is the book of John again 11 49 52 now in one of those in one of them named Caiaphas being the high priest that same year said it to them the them is referring to the rest of the council all right the rest of the Pharisees the Levites here you know nothing at all nor consider that it is expedient. The word expedient means to our benefit. So Caiaphas is explaining to the council, the Levites, all right, those that are sitting in Moses' seat, that it is to our benefit that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Now, we have to keep everything in what we call contextual reading, all right? During this particular um, junction here, only southern kingdom was in um, Jerusalem, all right? And a few stragglers from northern kingdom. But for the most part, only southern kingdom was here during the time of the Messiah's ministry. Now, verse 51 and this spoke he, the he is referring to Caiaphas. And this spoke he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, all right? He prophesied that Yahushua HaMashiach should die for that nation, southern kingdom. Verse 52, and not for that nation only, not for southern kingdom only, but that also he should gather together in one the two sticks, just like it talks about in Yakaz Kuyal in the book of Ezekiel, all right? The two sticks, all right? Northern kingdom and southern kingdom being reunited again because there's not a whole lot of teachings about the reunification of northern and southern kingdom. But what Caiaphas is explaining here now that the redemptive role of the Messiah was for him to be that atoning sacrifice for both houses northern and southern kingdom and Caiaphas is explaining that it is not his position to take that role all right but this role was um dedicated to the messiah Yahushua hamashiach and he prophesied that Yahushua hamashiach would die not for that 
which excuse me should die for that nation and not for that nation only but that also he should gather together which is a reunification in one the children of elohim that were scattered abroad so we already know around 721 bc that northern kingdom was scattered all right and so we're talking about here reunification so again yasharal even um, back then, all right, our so-called leaders, they overstood what was going on. This is the reason why they sent, all right, um, their Talmudine, all right, to see Yohukanan the Immerser and asked him, was he the one that was prophesied to come? And what was um, John the Baptist's uh, response? He said that he was not that light, but he was going to bear witness of that light. And then we see now where Yohukanan eventually immerses um, the Messiah, where the Messiah begins his ministry. All right. So I just wanted to um, bring that out. Now, um, another thing I wanted to do before we get started. All right. Um, I again, I don't do personal attacks, um, but I do challenge um, controversial topics. All right. And again, um, it's not to put myself above any other brother or sister. Um, I'm still learning just like um, a lot of other brothers and sisters are, all right? So again, we all piggybacking off one another, working um, as a body, all right, to try to bring um, the body back together, all right? So one brother might have a bit of information, another brother might have another bit of um, information, but this is all for um, the esteem of the Father Yahuwah. Um, now, why do I say overstand? All right. I've been asked that question a few times. The reason why I personally like the word overstand is because it seems um, to me and it works for me that it's like um, I have complete control over, over the situation now. All right. If I overstand it. All right. I have a complete um, grasp. All right. Of what's going on. And one thing that I clearly overstand. All right. Without a, a shadow of a doubt is that the father sent his son, Yahushua HaMashiach, to be that atoning sacrifice for the nation of Yashterol. All right. Hallelujah. Now, um, again, today's topic is going to be based upon the Song of Solomon. All right. The Song of Solomon. And my first question to all seekers and believers of Yahuwah and Yahushua HaMashiach is whether or not this is erotic poetry or is this all right, an uh, invitation for the nation of Yasharal, all right, to um, resume her relationship with the groom. All right, so I put it this way is it erotic poetry or, or is this a wedding proposal for the nation of Yasharal? I personally believe that the Song of Solomon is actually a wedding proposal um, for the nation of Yasharal. There's some erotic literature in there, I do agree, but overall, what we should be gathering from the Song of Solomon is that this is a wedding proposal for the nation of Yasharal. Now, what helped me to come to this conclusion now was my research led me to, um, to understand was that there are um, 21, all right, 21 Aleph Tav symbols in the Song of Solomon. That's going to be detrimental. All right. There are 21 Aleph Tav symbols in the Song of Solomon. And when I saw those 21 Aleph Tav symbols um, in the Song of Solomon, that was for me beyond um, a shadow of a doubt that this is a wedding proposal. All right. A wedding proposal. Now, the Song of Solomon was written around 960, 965 BC. So looking at that date, this lets us know that this song was written prior to the fall of Solomon. When Solomon began to lust after um, his wives and his wives threw him off track in following the father. All right. And um and the sole responsibility I'm going to lay on Solomon, all right, because he's the head of the household. It's his responsibility to stay on track. But he led his wives, all right, through a moth track, and he began to worship 
other um, gods, all right? I said it, okay, gods, all right? Um, so that's going to be very important. Now, um, what else? Let's go ahead um, and, and get down to the nitty gritty here, all right? Let's go to the song, the Songs of Solomon, and I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be starting with the second chapter, all right? Obviously, I'm not going to be able to read the whole um, songs, all right? I'm not going to be able to do that. I'll be up here for three or four hours. I would love to do it, but I just want to make sure that I keep everybody's um, tension span where nobody starts to drift off or anything like that, all right? It's a very interesting book. It's, 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 a, it's a lovely um, love story, but I truly believe that this is talking about the bride and the groom, all right? So let's go to that. The Songs of Solomon, and let's begin our studies. The Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. What I'm going to also be doing, too, all right, I'm going to be identifying when the bride is speaking and when the groom is speaking. That's going to be very important, and I'm going to also point out where the olatabs are, all right? Where the olive tabs are. Now, in the Song of Solomon 2 and 1, the bride is speaking first, all right? The bride is speaking first. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys, all right? So this woman is describing herself as a rose of Sharon in a lily of the valleys. Now, the first thing that I did now is say, listen, can I substantiate this woman considering herself top choice? All right. Can the nation of Israel, all right, find anywhere in the scripture where she is top choice, where she's bickerim, where she's first fruits? What we can do is let's go to Second Ezra. Uh, where are we at? Second Ezra, the um, fifth chapter. This is in the Apocrypha. Second Ezra 523. All right. This woman is calling herself top choice. And said, O Yahuwah, that bearest rule over every wood of the earth, and of all the trees thereof that hath chosen thee one vine. All right, one vine. And of all lands of the whole world that has chosen thee one pit. And of all the flowers thereof, one lily. So when we go now to the Song of Solomon, all right, the second chapter, verse one, we see Israel, be, this woman here is comparing herself as a choice flower, a lily, all right? Verse 25. And of all the depths of the sea that has filled thee one river, we know that's the Jordan River, and of all um, and of all built cities thou hast set apart Zion for thyself, and of all the fowls that are created thou hast named thee one dove, Yonah, dove, and of all the cattle that are made thou hast provided thee one sheep. All right, we know that that sheep, that lamb represents the Messiah. Verse 27, and among all the multitudes of people, thou hast gotten thee one people, and unto this people whom thou lovest, thy gavest Torah, that is approved of all. Approved of all, all right? So this woman, all right, this bride has a function, and her function is to follow Torah, all right? So I just wanted to bring that out. This woman here is comparing herself um, top choice. And Israel is top choice, all right? Verse 2, we have now the groom speaking, the Messiah. Now, so we have the confirmation. As a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. The bride speaks in verse 3. Uh, no, excuse me. I have a precept. I have a precept. I have a precept. I have a precept. No, let me go to read uh, verse three. In verse three, uh, verse three, the bride is speaking. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. 
right now when I saw that I said wow that's 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 real heavy so what I decided to do now is to go to Genesis I'm going to be reading um, chapter 1 verse 28 29 so let me just read verse 3 again now this is the bride speaking she is saying as the apple tree among the trees of the wood so is my beloved among the sons okay now let's go to um, Genesis the first chapter Genesis the first chapter 28 29 and Elohim blessed them okay Adam the, um, the Anamites or Adam this particular case Adam and, um, and um, Kawar or Eve and Elohim said it to them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and everything that moveth upon the earth so we have here now I want to go to um, Genesis or Bereshit 2 and 8 2 and 8 and Yahuwah Elohim planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he formed next one Deborim 11 10 to 12 all right Deborim Deuteronomy let me just read these and then after that I'll explain it all right Deborim 11 Deborim 11 10 to 12 listen to this because this is going to be very very careful so that we can stay on track what I'm going to do all right I just want to make sure that this is clearly overstood I'm going to read verse 3 again the bride is speaking the nation of Israel all right this just one minute here and she's saying as the apple tree among the trees of the wood so is my beloved among the sons and what I'm trying to do here is show that the father Yahuwah has sons but this bride is acknowledging the this one particular son and this one particular son is Yahushua HaMashiach all right and the one that's governing um this place where this woman is at is the groom so in other words I'm saying that this woman is in the Garden of Eden all right again this is poetry all right this woman is reminiscing or she's going back to the days of old where she used to be the same thing that we're doing today we're reminiscing we want to go back into the old paths so we can so that we can rekindle this relationship that we once had with the groom all right the Messiah this is what this woman is, woman is doing now watch this the groom is speaking on behalf of the father so watch what the groom is saying again Deborah 11 the 11th chapter the 10th verse for the land whether you go to possess wait excuse me let me read this again I'll make sure this is clearly um, understood for the land wherewith you go goest and to possess it is not as the land of Misraim or Egypt from whence you came out where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs so again we see a comparison being made here now the father took the nation of Israel all right the bride out of bondage into a land that's different from where she just left so um and the reason why i found this important is because after israel was brought into this land this land of canaan she wanted to go back into the land that she was taken from and this is even going on in israel today where israel is now starting to gravitate or go backwards into egypt again but the father's trying to explain to uh, to the bride listen this land that i'm about to um, give you is better than the land of egypt so why would you want to go back to a land all right that's in comparison not comparable to the nation of israel let me read on it is not as the land of egypt from whence you came out 
where thou sowest thy seed and waters it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land where the you go to possess is a land of hills, all right, of valleys, and drinketh water of the rains of Shamayim. All right. So this set apart land that I even spoke about in second Ezra is the fifth chapter, verses 23 to 27, where he's making a comparison that this land is the land of lands. And this is where the groom wants to take his bride in this set apart place. But the bride wants to go back into captivity into Miss uh, Mizraim again. So this woman in the Song of Solomon, she's talking about the delight in the land of Canaan, which I'm also saying is the land of Eden. All right. She's enjoying the delights, the apples, the pomegranates, all these things she's enjoying in the land. And she's enjoying these things as long as she's under the tutorship of the groom, Yahushua HaMashiach. That's what the Song of Solomon is all about. All right. Let me go on and prove it some more. A land which Yahuwah Elohim, thy husband, careth for. All right. I'm going to read it again. A land which Yahuwah Elohim careth for. The eyes of Yahuwah Elohim, thy mighty one, is always upon it. Always upon this land. From the beginning of the year, even to the end of the year, okay? That land, Egypt, okay, we can't say the same things about that land. But the land, Yerushalayim, the land that the groom, okay, gave to the bride as an inheritance is the top choice land. And then again, this woman in the Song of Solomon, is uh, she's enjoying all of those delight delights excuse me as long as she's following torah all right let's dig a little bit deeper let's go a little bit further with that all right let's go to deuteronomy or deborah the eighth chapter the eighth chapter and i want to read um seven through nine all right seven through nine for yahuwah elohim bringeth thee into a good land better than egypt I know there's a whole lot of talk about Egypt, this, Egypt, that, the pyramids, all of that stuff like that. But you know what? At the end of the day, according to Torah, our documents, is that Jerusalem was always better than Egypt. As long as the, um, the, the nation of Israel was following Torah. Now, when the father removed all right, his hand from the people in the land and the land, what we see now is the results of Israel not observing Torah. All right. So I'm going to read it again. For Yahuwah, um, thy Elohim, bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water and fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. You can't say that about Egypt. All right. Let me read on. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates a land of oil or olive oil and honey a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness you can never say that about egypt but we can always say that about jerusalem as long as israel was following the laws statutes and commandments the father's going to bring you into a land where there is no scarceness. All right. We'll be talking about one bulb of a grape. All right. Might have been about the size of a watermelon today or the size of a cantaloupe. We talking about a land flowing with milk and honey. Let me read on a little bit more. A land where thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig or dig brass. All right. So again, I just wanted to bring that um, important point out. 
because uh, we have to make sure that we understand what's going on. All right. So we're talking about this vineyard here. This vineyard is talking about Jerusalem and one more precept. All right. Let's go to the Song of Solomon. Let's go um, one and six. All right. One and six. Uh, let's see, one and six. Um, we have here now the bride speaking. All right, the bride is speaking. The bride is saying, Look not upon me because I am dark or black, because the sun has scorched me. My mother's sons were incensed against me. They made me keeper of the vineyards. But this, was, this is what's important that we have to uh, point out. Where it says the keeper of um, the vineyards between the words of and the is the word Aleph Tav. All right. This symbol, if you can see it. All right. The Aleph and the Tav. So this vineyard that this woman is in is not her vineyard where she's um, enjoying these luxuries. It is this this vineyard belongs to Olive Tav. Check it out in the Hebrew. All right. Read the songs of Solomon in Hebrew and you will see now again between the of and the 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 Olive Tav. This is the Olive Tav's vineyard. So now when we go back to verse three, it's uh, we have the bride speaking. The bride is saying as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. So she, she's even making um, reference that the son, okay, is the choice among all of the sons of Yahuwah. Because it tells us in the book of Revelation that this particular son was the only son that was found worthy, all right, to open the books. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, and that is referring to Yahushua HaMashiach. All right. Now, let me speed it up a little bit. All right. Um, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And so again, the Messiah's vineyard. OK. And this woman is enjoying the bride. She's enjoying all of the luxuries while she's in the vineyard all right she's uh she's under his shadow and when we look at now if we're under his shadow we're under the guidance and protection of the groom that's the whole purpose of everything when we see now the father we have the son we have the nation of yashara all right so each one is acting as a covering as a shadow, all right? Very important for us to overstand, all right? Let's see that I'm a bleed, la, 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 okay. Um, all right, be good, be good. Verse four, he brought me to the banquet house and his banner over me was love. Banquet house, I wanted to look that up. Now, whenever we hear the word banquet, what is the first thing that comes to mind? A feast, all right? We have here now where this bride is saying here, all right, um, he, which is the groom, brought me to the banquet house. So the groom is inviting the, the bride to this banquet and his banner over me was love. What is the banner? The banner is what we call the hoopah, all right? Again, this is a wedding proposal. All right. And this is a wedding marriage ceremony. All right. That the groom wants to have with his bride. Now. This event. In latter times in which we are living in now is all referencing the seventh month. Why the seventh month? The seventh month is Yom Teruah. All right. This is when the groom, Yahushua HaMashiach, all right, is coming for his bride. So I also see in the Song of Solomon, all right, Yom Teruah, which happens in the seventh month again. 
the groom will return for the bride. This is all what this is talking about. All right. Now, verse five, sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples. I just brought all these things out in the books of Deuteronomy. All right. When we talked about the abundance in the land, this is a banquet. Israel is now restored to her rightful place. All right. With raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick from love. His left hand is under my head and his right hand does embrace me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose or by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awake love until he pleases. Now, this is what I found interesting, all right, is that between the words awake and love, guess what we have again? Okay, you have the Aleph Ta symbol again, all right? The Aleph Ta. Again, this is a love story, okay? Um, an intense love story, all right? And we should all know now that this intense love story that the bride is having with the groom and the groom is having with the bride, it is also supposed to be manifested on our earthly relationships that we have with our wives and our children, all right? So this is all supposed to be a reflection, a mirror. So again, Yasharal, this is about a marriage. One more time, between the words awake in love, you have a very um, important symbol, which is the Aleph top. Until he pleases. Verse 8. Let's see here. Verse 8. Um, one second here. One second here. All right. Verse 8. The voice of my beloved, surely he comes leaping upon the mountains, uh, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Surely he stood behind our wall. He looks in the windows. He glances through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, and said to me, now, this is where it's going to get very interesting at, all right? Because now the Messiah begins to speak. The Messiah tells the bride, all right, rise up, or kum, my love my fair one, and come away. So what do we have here? We have the woman inside the house, all right? I'm going to prove this. We have the bride inside the house, and the Messiah is speaking and telling the woman to rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. The woman, this, the woman is asleep, all right? She's, she's, um, spiritually dead and i'm going to and I'm gonna show this here the messiah says rise up my love my fair one and come away for lo the winter is past this woman is she sleep the nation of israel this um flow the winter is past the rain is over and gone the flowers appear on the earth the time of the sing of, of birds is come and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land our land all right the groom brings the bride into his house where he can consummate the marriage. The woman is in her own house and the groom is telling the woman to rise. All right. There are seasons that have passed and the woman has slept too long. So now the groom is here telling the woman to come to rise. All right. Because it's now time for the actual marriage, the banquet. All right. Um, verse 13, the fig trees ripen, her green figs and the vines are in uh, blossom. They give forth their fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. All right. He's telling her that all things are prepared. Come to the banquet. All right. To the banner, the hoopa, so that we can renew our vows. Arise, my love, my fair, when it come away. 
O my dove, that are in the cleft of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see your continents. Now, between the words see and your is the word again, or the symbols again, Aleph Tav. All right? This is the groom speaking. Aleph Tav. Aleph Tav is telling the woman to come out of her house, to come out of hibernation. I want to see your face. The groom now wants to see his bride in her beautiful garment, in her beautiful attire, waiting for the consummation or the re uh, renewal of the vows. That's what he's saying here. Let me see your countenance. Let me hear your voice. And again, between the words here and your, guess what we have again? We have the symbols, Aleph Tav. All right, Aleph Tav. For sweet is your voice and your countenance is comely. Take us, the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. If they are in blossom, that means that the season is right. The season is right. And we know that the word seasons, all right, is referring to Moed, all right, the Moedims of Yahuwah, the feast days. Every single thing that's going on in the scripture from Genesis to Revelation is all surrounded around the feast days. All of it. All right. Every bit of it. This what makes scripture easy for me. All right. This is the reason why I can never say that the Messiah never existed. This is just some figment of our imagination. This is something that the Romans and and these other families got together and they listen. No, absolutely not. All right. There are too many um, examples in Torah explaining to us. All right. That someone needed to redeem the bride that went astray. Simple as that. All right. Simple as that. OK. But again, um, we have the olive tie between the here and the your. The, um, the groom wants to hear the bride's voice. For sweet is your voice and your countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for the vineyards are in blossom. Verse, fit, uh, verse 16, the bride is speaking. Again, like I said earlier, to get a better understanding of what's going on in the Song of Solomon, we must identify when the Messiah is speaking and when the bride is speaking. All right. So verse 16, the bride is speaking. The bride is saying, my beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies until the day is cool and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be you like a, a roe or young heart among the mountains of Bethur. Now, we have a real serious problem that's going on in verse 17, all right? A real big problem. Now, um, the word turn in Abri or Hebrew is the word sabab. And as a verb, it means to change direction. All right. It means to change direction. Again, a quick recap. The groom wants the bride to come out of the house. She hears, OK, the groom calling her, but she's in the house sleep. The groom is trying to explain to the bride, okay, all of these seasons had passed. The apples, the thorns, uh, the fig trees, things are blossoming, blossoming now, all right? And it's the beginning of um, a new season. It's time to wake up out of hibernation. But the woman won't come out of the house. She can't come up and the father keeps telling her to rise, kum, rise, rise, Yasharal. But the woman says here, I'm going to read verse 17 again. Until the day is cool and the shadows flee away, turn. The woman is actually telling the, um, the groom to go in another direction. Again, the word turn there is a Hebrew word, sabab. 
All right. And as a verb, it means to change direction. The woman originally, remember, she said, my beloved is mine, meaning this. And in Yashara, we do this. We want to follow Torah at our own convenience. All right. I'm busy now. I'm doing X, Y and Z. All right. I get with you a little bit later. So again, here in verse 17, the, um, the bride is telling the groom to go aside, okay, uh, to change direction and be like a roll or a heart among the, um, the mountains of Bethur, which is the mountains of separation. This is what she's saying. I get to you a little bit, uh, get to you a little bit later. Right now, I'm busy. Is we don't see this happening today. This was the reason why, okay, the bride was kicked out of the Garden of, of, of Eden. This is the reason why the bride was kicked out of the land of Canaan. Because at the appointed times, when the groom wanted to have this intimate relationship with the bride, she was never ready. I, I get there a little bit later. I know from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown is the Shabbat, but I'm kind of busy right now. I'll meet you on Sunday. That's what we did. Shavuot, okay then. You count seven, seven. Seven times seven is 49, plus one day is 50. Meet me on the 50th day. I'm kind of busy right now. I'll meet you on the 52nd day. Huh? This is what happened. The lamb's supposed to be killed between the evenings on the 14th. What I'm going to do, I'll kill the lamb on the 13th because on the 14th I have something else to do. Being that Israel didn't want to follow the commandments, she was exiled and she's now scattered amongst the four corners of the earth. All right. This is our present situation. Now, um, let's go to the Songs of Solomon, chapter five. Let's skip around a little bit here. Chapter five. Um, this is the Messiah speaking here. The Messiah is saying, I, I am coming to my garden, my sister, my bride. So he's coming to his garden now. When I read that, the first thing that came to mind was uh, the book of Bereshit, where um, the groom is walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And he calls for his bride, Adam and Eve. He calls for them. But she's not there. And so the Messiah is speaking here. Look at the parallels. I am coming to my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh and my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink. Yes, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. So this is talking about the banquet. Everything is already prepared. Verse 2, the bride speaks. I was asleep. I was asleep. The bride is acknowledging that she was asleep when the groom came. I was asleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved, Yahushua HaMashiach, that knocks. So if he's knocking, he's outside of the place where the bride is. The bride is inside of the house. The groom is knocking on the door, telling the bride that it is time for the wedding. Watch this. Uh, let's see, let's see. I was asleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocks. The Messiah now speaks, all right, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. Why is the Messiah wet? Because he's on the outside. The dew represents the rain. The rain and the dew rep represents now um, blessings. OK, substance. He wants the woman to come outside and be part of the dew, the rain, the blessings. But she's she's she fell asleep. Um, verse three. OK, verse three. The bride is speaking. The bride is in the house and the bride is saying, I have put off. 
I have put off uh, my garments. How should I put it on? This is where it's going to get very, very interesting. All right. The bride is speaking and she said, I have put off my garments between off in the word my. Guess what we have there? The olive top symbol. This woman had put off her garment. Her dress. Her, 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 her bridal um, garment, her tunic, she is taking it off. The responsibility of the nation of Israel is to never take off the garment. We have we, our responsibility is to be um, on point in season and out of season, meaning that the bride has to always be ready and prepared for the groom. Because scripture tells us now that um, he's going to come as a thief in the night. But if we keep our garments on, he can't come to us as a thief in the night because we're prepared. We always have our garment on. But the nation of Israel has fallen asleep and she has taken off Olive Tav, the garment. I'm going to say it again. When you read verse three in Hebrew, between the words off and my, we have the symbol Olive Tav. The woman has taken off her garment. The woman goes on to say now, how should I put it on? She don't even know how to put it back on anymore. She don't even know how to come back into covenant relationship anymore. That's how long her garments have been off. How should I put it on? I have washed my feet. And between washed and my, we have again, Aleph Tav. I'm not making this up. This is what's helping me to get a better understanding of what's going on in the Songs of Solomon. This is a wedding proposal. This is all alluding to a feast day called Yom Teruah because the Messiah already came and filled, fulfilled now the spring festivals. And we're now coming to the end of the spring festival, which is going to now bring us to the next festival, which is called the end gathering, which begins to happen in the seventh month. All right. How should I put it on? I have washed. I lift off my feet. How should I defile them? My beloved, my beloved, excuse me, put his hands, put his hand by the den or the cave of my heart and my bowels was moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh upon the handles of the lock. So now the woman, she finally gets up and she goes out and she know that the father or the groom was there because the groom was already adorned in his garment. He was already decked out in the frankincense and the myrrh and the oil and everything like that. And so his essence was left. So when a woman goes out, she she feels his presence. She feels the Ruach HaKadosh. She feels that she knows that he was there, but he already left. He's gone. There is a thing called you got there too late. Too late. Let me read on and show you this. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved hath withdrawn himself and was gone. It was too late. There is a such thing as too late. This woman had taken off her garments, didn't know how to put her garments back on. The groom was at the door. He came at an hour that she thought that he wouldn't come. And he came. And now it's too late. OK, the groom has already left that bride. OK, that particular bride. And yes, the groom has more than one bride. That particular bride there. OK, that particular bride. She missed the boat. We'll read on. But my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul had faileth, failed. Uh, let's let me see here. Let me see here. I'm going to read on for time constraint. OK, 
My soul had failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchman that goes about the city found me. Now, this is where it gets interesting at. We have to identify who are the watchmen. The watchmen would, would, would be those of us that's doing what I'm doing now. All right. The watchmen are those who are saying, keep on your garments. All right. Make sure that you're following the laws, statutes and commandments. Those are your garments so that when the groom comes, you'll be prepared. You don't want to be unprepared when the groom comes. And so now the watchman that goes about the city found the woman. They beat the woman and they wounded the woman. They wounded the woman. All right. Uh, let's see. I wanted to do something here. Um, the word smoke is the Hebrew word naka, and it's the Strong's number 5221, and it means to smite, beat, or kill. All right. Again, that's the Strong's number 5221. We're not gonna, I'm not going to be able to do a whole lot of writing on the board. You know, that's my thing. I like to write on the board because it seems like it's, it's, um, it simplifies things um, a whole lot. You know, but again, because of the glare and what I'm trying to do today, I'm not going to be able to um, use the board. But again. The Hebrew word for um, smote is naka, N-A-K-A-H, and it's the Strong's number 5221, and it means to smite, um, beat, or even kill. This woman was actually, this, this woman was either, um, I'm going to say, based upon contextual reading, that this woman was killed. All right, she was killed. Um, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, verse 8. Excuse me, verse 7. The watchman that goes about the city found me. They defeated me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took away. And between the words away and my is Alatab again. Remember, I said now that what makes this easy for me to understand is that the word Alatha is mentioned 21 times, which for me is telling a story of a woman that longs for the groom, but she's taken off her garments and she don't want to go out to meet the groom. And she said, I get back to you later. And with that mindset that she had, the groom had already left. She now goes out into the city. All right. And watchmen find her. They take her and they beat her and possibly kill her. All right. She missed the wedding. The watchman that goes about the city found me. They defeated me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took away um, Olive Tav, my mantle from me. They took it away from her. OK, I gave you a talent. All right. You're supposed to increase with that talent. All right. So they took the mantle away. The mantle is going to be representing a talent. All right. Instead of um, bringing forth um, or bringing back an increase, she buried her talent. All right. And so, listen, take that talent away from that particular servant there, because that servant is a lazy. All right. Um, dormant um, servant. All right. We, we have no need of him or her. The woman begins to say, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find Aleph Tav, because between the words find and my is the Aleph Tav symbol again. So the woman is saying, if you find Aleph Tav, my beloved, then you tell him that I am sick from love. Now the woman questions the bride. OK, how is your beloved more than another beloved? Oh, you fairest among women. What is your beloved more than another beloved that you do so adjure us? Now, the bride answered, my bride is white and ruddy, the chief among 10,000. Talking about, we, OK, we know this is the Song of Solomon. But what I'm trying to do now is um, being at the olive top symbols are there. OK, that this is actually a reference to Yahushua HaMashiach. All right. Um, his eyes, where well, am go back. His hairs are as, a, are as fine as gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside the water, uh, water brooks washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as banks of sweet herbs. His lips are as lilies dropping like myrrh. 
His hands are as rings of gold set with beryl. His body is as ivory work overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His aspects is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, now, um, when we look at all of those things as this woman describes the groom, we can see that a lot of that is actually referring to um, some of the things that um, the Levitical priesthood wore, all right? And um, we know that the Messiah is the ultimate priest, all right? So we're not missing a beat here, all right? We're not missing a beat. This is all referencing um, the Messiah. All right. Now let's go to uh, let's see here. Let's see. What do we want to do here? All right. We want to make sure this is nice and tight. Let's go to the book of Matthew Yahoo um, 25, the book of Matthew 25. All right. Matthew 25. There's so much more to this. All right. So much more. But again, I don't want to do a two hour video because uh, it might be um, overkill. I think about now everybody should have pretty much uh, where I'm going with this. Now, let's look at this woman again. All right. That fell asleep and she wasn't ready when the groom came. All right. She wasn't ready. Let's look at another parallel and uh, let's look at a, let's look at another scripture and let's see if you can make the parallel, okay, with Matt, uh, the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter in the Songs of Solomon, just to make sure that um, you're understanding where I'm coming from and you're not saying, oh, because thought about just making something up. All right? I, I'm not. This is like clear. I mean, Stevie Wonder can see this. Uh, the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter, I'm going to read verses 1 to 13. Then shall the kingdom of Shamayim be like unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom is the Messiah. All right. These ten virgins, they had um, lamps and five of them were wise and five were foolish. So see the parallels. The, the, the bridegroom knocks on the door. And five are unwise and five are wise. But this is the same thing that happened in the Song of Solomon. When the Messiah goes to meet this particular groom to bring her to the banquet, she says, turn aside. By the time she gets to the door, the groom is already gone because she waited too late. Let me read on. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. What I'm going to do also, too, now is that, um, again, I'm going to th there's a lot that's going on with the number 10 in virgins and oils and lamps. I'll do that at another time. But again, I, I, I don't want to go off on a whole nother um, topic. But Matthew, the 25th chapter speaks volumes. All right. It speaks volumes. And I can't wait to do that. All right. But there's a whole lot of other things that's, that's on my list. But when I get to this right here, it's going to be like, wow. All right. Um, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So they always had on their garments, always had on their garments. In the songs of Solomon, the woman took off Aleph Tav's garment. She took it off. But it says here now, but there were other brides. All right. It was other brides there. OK. And they had their oil and they was all ready to go. Verse five. While the bridegroom tarry, they all slumbered and slept. All right. They all slumbered and slept. All ten of them. And at midnight, that word midnight, I'm going to get back to. All right. That word midnight is very, very important. And at midnight, there was a there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. All right. Excuse me. Go you out to meet him. 
The virgins were in the house sleep. Go out to meet him. The bride, see, the groom wants to bring the bride to the wedding chamber to consummate the marriage. All right. This woman in the Songs of Solomon, she was in the house and the groom is um, telling the woman to come out to do the very same thing. All right. But she says, I'm tired. I'm busy right now. OK, um, I just spoke to you yesterday. I mean, today is not the Shabbat. And my argument is this, is that we know that the father has feast days. All right. And these feast days are intimate relationships that the father wants to have with his bride. But I'm also here to say this, too, is that the father can deal with you any day of the week. And being that the father can deal with you any day of the week, you have to always make yourself available for the father. Always. That's the responsibility of the bride. This means that the bride is in subjection to her husband. She always makes herself available to the husband. Always. Huh? I provided everything for you. Food, shelter, and clothing. I read that in Deuteronomy. I'm giving you the choice land, the best of everything. In the land that I'm giving you, there's no scarceness of, every, of, of anything. So being that I've given you all these things, any time that I ask to have this intimate relationship with you, you better make sure, OK, that you're making yourself available to the groom, your husband. All right. Now, um, verse six, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for your for our lamps are going out. But the wise answer saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. The same thing that happened with the woman. The woman had taken off her garment. She now wants to go meet the groom. The groom was already gone. The groom, um, the groom is already gone. The bride runs into the watchman. All right. This woman, she's going into the city. All right. And the other um, um, chapters in the Song of Solomon, it talks about how the woman goes into the city, into the highways and byways, looking to buy oil. All right. But the wise answer saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Verse 10. And while they went to buy the unwise, while they went to buy the bridegroom came. All right. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. All right. Let me show you something what it means when the door is shut. All right. Remember during the time of the flood. OK. Noah, Noah, he preached. Noah. OK. He preached. He preached. He preached. He ministered. He ministered. He ministered. Until that appointed time. OK. That appointed time. Everything was um, loaded up into the ark. The father shut the door. When the father shuts the door, no man can open it. No man can open it. All right. So as the flood water started to um, increase, 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 the people began to consider, wow, this thing that Noah spoke is actually coming to pass. Boom, 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 boom. Let us in. Let us in. But no. The groom had shut the door and those who had the opportunity to come in, the door is not shut to them. Now, let's speed it up a little bit further. Now, we have a situation now where um, the virgin, there are five virgins that are ready. The other five virgins are unwise. They didn't take enough oil. So now they get to the door and the door is shut. Okay, there's a Hebrew word called um, Neela, on the closing of the gate, all right, which happens in the seventh month, which means that even in um, this last part of the feast days in the seventh month, there's going to come a point, Neela, where the, um, the closing of the gate, where you, you run out of time, you, you, you miss the boat, all right, you miss the boat. Now, you speed it up a little bit here. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they were ready. Excuse me. And they that were ready went in with them 
to the marriage and the door was shut. Those that were ready went in with him to the marriage. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterwards came the other virgin saying, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Wow, can you imagine that? I know you not. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So it's very important, all right, that we keep our garments on, all right? We keep our garments on. Now, in the Songs of Solomon, remember it had talked about the woman taking off her garment? Um, when, she had, when you take off your garment, there's a, there is another garment that you have on, but that's not the, um, the preparation garment that you should have on in regard to consummating the marriage with the groom. So when this woman, the Song of Solomon, took off her garment, she had on another apparel. Watch this. The book of um, goes, um, Metin Yahu, the 22nd chapter. Um, wow. Look at the time here. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to do one. I'm going to start the first verse. I'm going I'm to I'm read this real fast. And Yahushua HaMashiach answered and, and spoke unto them, saying, by parables and said, the kingdom of Shamayim is likened to a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Okay. And sent forth his servants, which are the watchmen, to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come like the bride in the song of Solomon. All right. They would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are hidden, which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Come into the marriage. All right. Read on. But they made light of it and went their way. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and he went, excuse me, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt up their city. Then said he to his servants, the wedding is ready. The wedding is ready, but they which were bitten were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came and to see the guests, both bad and good, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. So this bad guest that tried to sneak in from the back door had on a garment, but the groom looked at that servant, okay, and said, what's going on with that picture there? The same thing that happened in the Song of Solomon. The woman had taken off her garment. She had on another garment and wanted to attend the marriage. She, took it, she had taken off Alatav's garment, had on another garment, and wanted to attend the marriage OK, and the groom spotted her. Let me read on. And when the king came in, he saw the guests. He saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. All right. His heart is starting to tremble now. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
for many are called, but few are chosen. So this is the reason why I said that I believe that the woman in the Songs of Solomon eventually died. All right. Because you, you, you're not able or you can't attend the wedding of Yahuwah not having on the right apparel. OK, the right apparel. OK, you can't take off Olive Tov's garment. You have to keep the garment on. All right. And you have to have that extra reserve of oil. OK, to go that extra mile. Because if we understand how marriages work, all right, the the the, um, the the groom, he does a betrothal, okay, to the woman. The groom now has time, okay, to build and prepare a house for the bride. But the bride is already claimed. What the bride is now doing is waiting for the groom to come and bring her to his house. That's how Hebrew marriages work. And that's just a small glimpse of it. I get into that a little bit later. And you can see clippets of this when we see what happened with um, Abraham, Eliezer, in regard to Isaac and Rebekah. All right. We see how that whole thing happened there. Now, I had talked about um, the no man know of the hour. I had talked about the whole thing um, with um, midnight. In the book of Matthew, the 25th chapter, the sixth verse, because it says in that midnight, there was a cry made and the bridegroom came. Go you out to meet him. Now, midnight is going to be very, very important. All right. Um, at midnight, there was a cry. My argument is this. The cry or the blowing of the trumpet is referencing now Yom Teruah. This event is going to happen on the seventh month, the seventh month. All right. So midnight is very, very important. All right. I'm going to read some notes that I have here. All right. To try to give us a better um, understanding of what's going on with midnight. OK. Uh, la, 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 la. Um, looking at the feast days here. All right. We'll talk, we, we're going to begin with Passover. Uh, we know that. Um, the Messiah has his um, last meal with his disciples, okay, um, on the 14th, all right, on the 14th at even, when the sun falls completely below the horizon, and let's say for argument's sake, it, it's 6 o'clock, all right? So the, what I'm bringing out here is, is, is the last 24 hours of the Messiah's life, um, was very crucial and very important, all right? And what I want to bring out, all right, see, I, I would write it on the board and it would be a lot easier, um, but just try to follow along with me. If you're not um, um, overstanding what I'm saying, please leave me a message and I'll get back to you at my earliest convenience, all right? Um, I, I, I promise that, all right? And, uh, and just for argument's sake also too, um, my, um, my email is newstudy, N-U-study, S-T-U-D-Y, new n e w age a g e at aol.com you can also leave a message there and i might be able to get back to you a little bit quicker um uh, from there and um i'll be on facebook soon all right I i'll just leave that there but again back to what i'm saying now um midnight is gonna be very important we have a situation where the last 24 hours of the messiah's life is very um important because it's broken up into um increments all right 24 hours, we have the watches. Watches happen every three hours, and eight times three is 24. So the last 24 hours of the Messiah's um, life is very important. Um, so it began at evening. You can go to Mark 14th chapter, the 17th verse. When the sun went down, and let's say about 6 o'clock on PM, um, Mark, because of Mark 14 and 7, he knew that the, uh, the duration of the Passover meal was three hours, all right? Three hours, so from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, um, we have the Passover meal. But with inside of these three hours, from 6 to 9, because 9 o'clock is another watch, all right? So we have the first watch happening from 6 to 9, another watch happening from 9 to 12, another watch happening from 12 to 3, another watch happening from 3 to 6, and then you have the morning part of the 14th 
In the morning part of the 14th, you have another morning watch from 6 to 9, another morning watch from um, 9 to 12, and then another morning watch from 12 to 3, and then from 3 to 6. And when the sun falls completely below the horizon on the 14th, it now ushers in the 15th, the nighttime part of the next day, all right? Again, if, if anything sounds confusing, um, let me know, and I'll do another um, exercise explaining this on the board, all right? So um, we have here that, the, uh, that this meal that the Messiah had with his disciples, this Talmudine, lasted three hours, and that it concluded with a sing, um, a sing of a hymn. So the first thing that I noticed that the Messiah did was to sing a hymn with his disciples. Then Mark says that when they had sung um, this hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So my argument is that at the ninth hour, excuse me, at the um, at nine o'clock brings us to now um, we have the, the night watches, which now brings us to the, the first part, the, the first watch. All right. That, that would be the, the first watch there. It now brings us to 9 o'clock p.m. And um, we have Mark telling his disciples um, that they, um, you know, he, he'd go into the Garden of Get, um, Gethsemane and the Messiah went to pray. And he wants his disciples to stay at the bottom of the hill, okay, because he wants to now have this intimate relationship with the Father, okay, and he's going up there to the top of the mount. And he, and he comes down the first time, all right, and he finds his disciples sleep, all right? He finds them sleep, and he says, you cannot watch for one hour. This now brings us from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock. The Messiah does this two more times, all right? 10 o'clock, two more times, brings us to what? 12 o'clock noon. What I found interesting was this is that when the bridegroom left his Talmudin to commune with the father, and when the groom came back down, the bride was asleep. The whole thing is that the Messiah wanted his Talmudin to stay in prayer and to watch. But every time the, the bridegroom came down, the bride was always asleep. Always asleep. The first time he came, the bride was asleep. The second time he came down from off the mount, um, the bride was asleep. And the third time when he came down, the bride was asleep. And we know the rest of the story because it says now, sleep on. Because I have to take this cup. But the problem that I had that at the midnight hour, this is the time when most people are asleep. This is the time when the Messiah is going to make his grand entrance. The midnight is symbolic of he's going to come when people are asleep. All right. And what we want to do now, we don't want to be asleep at that midnight hour when the groom comes. We want to always make sure that we're prepared because when the Messiah comes down the third time, which is now 12 o'clock, what happens? Judas and the Pharisees come and they take the Messiah. All right. They take the Messiah and from 12 o'clock to three o'clock. All right. What do you have? We have now the Pharisees now scrutinizing everything that the Messiah did. Remember, like I said before. You have a, your first watch from 6 to 9, another watch from 9 to 12, and from that watch of 9 to 12, the Messiah was dealing with his disciples, trying to get them to stay awake. At the 12th hour, we have now Judas coming now, uh, betraying the Messiah, along with the Pharisees. They bring now the Messiah, uh, so from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, we have a situation where they're now scrutinizing, scrutinizing everything that the Messiah is doing. And from six o'clock to nine o'clock now, he's been um, ridiculed. He's been beaten and everything like that by Herod. OK, and now from um, six o'clock to nine o'clock in the morning, 
the morning time of, of, of the 14th, we have the Messiah now nailed to the cross or to the stake. All right. To the tree. And then from nine o'clock to twelve o'clock. Now, this is twelve o'clock daylight hours where we now have even. And from that point now, it was darkness upon the face of the earth for three hours. Darkness. So we see now at twelve o'clock midnight. OK, twelve hours um, prior, he was left alone. Left alone. It was complete darkness. It was midnight. Then 12 hours later now, okay, there was darkness upon the whole face of the earth here, okay? So we're looking at like, like a solar eclipse here. And then from 12 o'clock to the next um, watch, which brings us to 3 o'clock p.m., we have now the Messiah giving up the Ruach. It's been accomplished. It's done. All right? And then from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock now, those last three hours now, this is the time that um, Joseph of, of Arimathea, okay, they're now taking the body off the cross, burying the lamb, all right, uh, because they have to be ready now for the 15th. Because remember, by the time the 15th comes down, nobody's able to leave out of the house, all right? So I just wanted to bring all of that out, okay? Everything is important. The watches are important. And I know and believe I'm solely convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the Father sent his son, Yahushua HaMashiach. And these prophetic shadow pictures that I'm seeing and other brothers are seeing, brothers like Lamar Yahu, Baruch, uh, Brother Baruch, Brother um, um, Shemak, um, Brother Jediah, Brother, um, wow, um, Emmanuel, Brother Amadawan, all these brothers, we're all talking and seeing all these prophetic shadow pictures and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the messiah exists okay you're not going to be able to convince us otherwise it's just not going to happen oh yeah my brother medad yahoo you're not going to be able to convince us otherwise all right so again i just wanted to bring that out all right um make sure that everybody had a um hopefully get a better understanding of what's going on all right and i pray that this lesson has been a blessing um, the Songs of Solomon is about um, a wedding proposal. Um, is, is talking about um, um, Yom Teruah. All right, that's what it's talking about. And again, um, Meshbika, um, thank you for your time, and, um, and I see you the next time on uh, Watchmen of the Faith Ministries. Shalom.